Welcome everyone. Welcome to Indivisible Huron Valley. Welcome back. Uh, Indivisible Huron Valley is a local nonpartisan group of citizens. Uh, Indivisible stands in solidarity with black, indigenous, and people of color to actively protect, defend, and promote the principles and institutions of democracy for all people. So that is our mission statement. Thought I'd read that right off the bat. Our speaker tonight is the person who will help us understand another voting rights initiative. And he needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, he's uh, the field organizer for Voters Not Politicians, field coordinator for Voters Not Politicians, which is part of the Promote the Vote 2022 initiative. So please give a warm welcome to our fellow Indivisible Huron Valley member and dear friend, Brian Watson. Well, thank you. So tonight I am, I have lots of buttons. I have lots of hats that I wear. Tonight, the button that I'm wearing, the hat that I'm wearing is representative of Voters Not Politicians, VNP. That's the button. So as I'm talking, remember that that's, who's, that's who I'm talking for. Uh, I know that four years ago, five years ago, um, a lot of people in this room and a lot of people in this town uh, worked really hard with both Voters Not Politicians and Promote the Vote, two separate groups who put two separate proposals on the ballot, passed them both by 60% or 67%. You know, enormous, unbelievable turnout, unbelievable uh, success. But that was five years ago. And as you know, any victory you get this year is gonna be challenged by the other side for the next four years, five years. This is no, ex uh, no exception. Promote the Vote is back in 2022. And they're back because, as Sherry said, it's a defend democracy year again. Maybe more than ever. Uh, because there are people out there who are looking really hard at how to get around the rules. And how to win without getting all the votes you know we know that this is going on and we know that they know how to do this right they know how to do this they've got their own petitions they run the legislature they know how to do this we have to do the hard work we have to do it the hard way so promote the vote 2022 do you guys recognize this those of you that did this in you know, five years ago, remember the red stripe on the, on the clipboard? So everybody knows this is the good guys. Um, so we're back with another petition. And the petition this year, called Promote the Vote 2022, is another constitutional amendment. What we need to do is get 425,059 valid signatures by July 11th. We're talking 15 weeks. That's not a lot of time. That's not a lot of time. But hey, we did it before. We're gonna do it again, because if we don't, democracy's on the line. So this is a democracy. This is a democracy. And it's a democracy because we have elections in part, but elections have to be fair. If elections have to be democratic. And for elections to be democratic, all adult citizens must be equally able not only to cast a ballot, but to make sure that their vote counts, to make sure their vote counts. And that's what this, that's what this proposal is all about. This proposal is all about making sure that it's easy to vote and harder to cheat. Easy to vote, harder to cheat. That people who should be able to cast a ballot can in fact cast a ballot and those ballots will be counted and the counts will matter. So who is Promote the Vote 2022? It's a coalition. You see a list here. I gotta tell you this list is a couple months old. There's 13 organizations on this list. You see the first one of course is Voters Not Politicians but also Promote the Vote, also ACLU, also League of Women Voters. We're talking about some large organizations here. But as I say, this is two months old. There's 13 names on this list. It's now up to 20. 
It's a large coalition of organizations in Michigan trying to get this work done. And this is an important thing. This is an important point that this isn't just one organization trying to push a, dare I say it, special interest in. This is all the people that care about elections, all the people that care about democracy, all working together to make this, uh, to make this happen. You don't need to read this whole thing, but this slide is gonna be up for a while because this is the whole presentation. Because the question is, for you as voters and as, you know, hopefully signers of this petition, the obvious question you should be asking, everybody else is asking, what's in the proposal, right? What's in the proposal? There's eight points here. I'm gonna go through each one of them. First thing to know is that this is a constitutional amendment. This is not a statute. Now, some of you may know that uh, when a ballot initiative goes forward, there's three ways that you can, that, that they can be uh, or, organized. One is a constitutional amendment, one is a statute, and one is a repeal of a statute. And each one has a different, has a different requirements. Constitutional amendments are the hardest to do. 425,059 signatures is a lot. But constitutional amendments as ballot initiatives cannot be overturned by anybody except the voters, right? They cannot be hijacked by the legislature, for example. Uh, and the reason that we do, we, the reason that we're taking a constitutional amendment approach is exactly that. We, frankly, we've got a legislature that we cannot trust. We've got a legislature that would not like want this to happen who would stop this if they could. So we do it as a constitutional amendment, among other reasons, to make sure that neither this legislature nor any legislature in the future can undo what we're doing here. And what we're doing here is defending democracy. So what's in the proposal? The first and most important point actually surprised me. I didn't know that there is no constitutional right today to vote. You probably thought you, well, of course. <laughs> right, right, we learned, we learned this last month. We learned this last month and, and it bears repeating. We do not have a constitutional right to vote unless this proposal passes. And when this proposal passes, the first thing it does is to say that you have a fundamental right, a fundamental right in Michigan under Michigan's constitution to vote. What difference does it make? It makes this difference. As a fundamental right in the constitution, it cannot be overturned, it cannot be interfered with, it cannot be prevented by any law, by any rule, by any regulation, you can't do that. You can't just have a bunch of politicians say, yeah, those people don't need to vote. These people don't need to vote. These people can vote, but we won't count their votes, right? And that is what's going on. So step one is to make this a fundamental right in the Constitution. That seems like a really obvious thing to do, but there it is. So the second point, now this doesn't affect a lot of people but there are people, there are voters in Michigan who live overseas and they vote from overseas. Right now under today's, uh, under, under today's election law, when you mail a ballot from overseas, it has to arrive at your clerk's office before the polls close. So election day, eight o'clock, it has to arrive. If it doesn't arrive on time, it doesn't count. So this proposal would change that and say, no, no, no. If it's postmarked before election day or on or before election day and arrives within six days of election day, then it still counts and it still counts, right? So 
Who's overseas? Well, military. Military is the, is the first people you think of, but it's not just military. It's military, it's students, people who work, maybe people who just live overseas. You know, they've got a vacation house and they happen to be there uh, on election day. So, uh, so that option is in there. That's uh, a second point in the, in the proposal. The third point, in, third point in the proposal has to do with identifying yourself as who you are. And it's important to understand, as you talk about, as we talk about this is this is voter ID or photo ID. It's important to understand first how this works today. In Michigan law today, before this proposal, in order to vote at the polls, you must show a photo ID or sign an affidavit that says, I am who I am and I haven't already voted someplace else. Right? That's signing an affidavit. Now, signing an affidavit is not just signing a piece of paper. It's signing a piece of paper under, you know, under penalty of perjury, right? Which is, that's no, that's no joke. Under this proposal, that becomes a con constitutionally protected process that says, in order to identify yourself, you show a photo ID or you sign an affidavit testifying to the fact that you are who you are. Why do we need to put this in the Constitution? To prevent legislators from changing the rules and saying, oh, no, 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 you have to have a certain kind of photo ID and you, you know, signatures are no good and so on. It also accounts for absent voters. Absent voters, when they submit their ballot, sign the, back, uh, sign the envelope, right? The signature is how they identify themselves. This proposal would make that also part of the Constitution. Why do we do that? Because there have been proposals in the legislature to say, no, 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 you have to send in your social security number or your, your picture or all this other stuff. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to take, we're going to take the way it works today, the way it has worked for many years, for many elections, the way it has worked safely for many elections without problem and keep it. Again, it ain't broke. We don't need to fix it. The next point has to do with funding. We know that not every, every locality, not every jurisdiction uh, can find the funds to provide the support for the elections that, that you know, voters need. And one of the places that this, re this particularly comes in, into play is, again, absent voters. Absent voters, many of us live in communities where, you know, if you're an absent voter, right outside the clerk's office or somewhere uh, convenient, there's a drop box. And you drive in, throw the drop box in, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, throw it in, easy peasy, go on your way. Well, there are many other communities where there is no drop box, which makes absent voting harder. There are major communities, Detroit, for example, where there might be a drop box, but maybe there's like one and it's way over there and you can't get to it. So this proposal addresses that, it addresses the deployment of drop boxes, but more importantly, it addresses the need to fund at the state level, the need to provide the funding to all these localities so that they can afford to have safe, secure, convenient voting. Again, we have to pass a law to do this? Well, apparently, yes. This particular point, this is about audits, election audits. And certainly this year, if you've been paying attention, you've been hearing a lot about election audits. Uh, certainly in other states, <laughs> they've been, they've just been gone crazy with election audit, but also here in Michigan, trying to, trying to do that. I read this part of the proposal and I thought, we have to pass a proposal to do this? Why isn't this obvious? Nonetheless, here it is. Under this proposal, elections must be audited. 
and the audits must be secure. More importantly, the audits must be performed by election officials, not ninjas, not crazy people, election officials who actually know how to do audits. I think you, you guys probably know that in the 2020 election, there were 250 audits done in Michigan of the election results across the state. Why? Because the audits are mandated. You know, that was proposal three from uh, 2018. Even with that, there are people out there, in fact, there's a competing pet petition demanding that you have to do other, other kinds of audits. We're saying no. We're saying we have election officials, we have a process, they know how to do this, they're the ones who should be doing this. Again, I read this and I think, we have to put this in the Constitution to say that the official audits have to be done by official people? Well, apparently we do. And so there it is. This next provision, which is early voting. Again, many people may have heard in other states that there is early voting. Early voting starts and whatever, and people start lining up, and, and this is going on. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking Georgia in particular, but, but many other states. We don't have early voting in Michigan. Some people have said, well, we've got absentee voting, and that's the same thing. So if, if, if you have not done absentee voting, absentee vote in, in absentee voting, you get your ballot 45 days before election day. And that's as soon, that's as early as you can vote. You know, I voted last, the last election, I voted 45 days before election day. Like, I think the clerk was going, wait, wait, we're not ready. <laughs> hey, all you gotta do is accept it. But absentee voting is not early voting. Early voting is actually showing up at a place, getting a ballot, you know, registering, showing your identification, getting a ballot, filling it out, and importantly, putting it in the tabulator and having it counted on site. That doesn't happen with absentee voting. Absentee voting, the ballots all get stacked up until election day and then they start counting them. But early voting, they count them, count them right away. It's just like voting on election day, except it's nine days or 10 days early. Under this proposal, there would be nine days of early voting. When, what are those nine days? Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Two weekends, two weekend days, and five weekdays before election day, right? So, there have been other people asking, well, should election day be a holiday, you get paid time off or whatever? You know, if we, what if we gave you nine other days other than the sec first, was it the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November? Uh, what if you gave you another, other days to vote? And to vote in the same way that you would vote uh, if, if you were showing up on election day. Now, this is gonna cost money, yes, but remember the other provision about the state providing the funding so that, uh, so that local uh, election officials can afford to do this. Makes it easier, makes it easier to vote, and again, makes it harder to cheat. Public disclosure of charitable donations. There's a lot of, well, both money and more, more importantly, facilities that are donated to the local jurisdiction in order to carry, carry off uh, elections. Simple, a simple example, a private school, Catholic school, um, you know, they've got a gym. They say to the local official, hey, you can use our gym. It's not your gym, it's our gym, but it's okay, you can use it. We'll, we'll make it, set it up. You can have it as a polling place. People can come in, vote, et cetera, et cetera. That's a donation that is considered a donation. It's an in-kind donation uh, for the purpose of helping the, the local jurisdiction carry out an, an election. What's wrong with that? 
right? Well, apparently in the wake of the last election, there were some complaints about donations that were being made. And therefore, uh, there were bills that were passed in the Michigan legislature and around the country to say you can't take donations anymore. Um, so this says, yes, you can. This says, you know, don't be stupid. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can. It's fine for people to do this. There are some provisions that are built in. It must be fully disclosed. Where's the money's coming from? It can't be coming, you know, can't be dark money. But it's got to be fully disclosed and it's got to be equitably available to everybody. You know, you can't say, oh, we're going to give money or donations to this particular community, but not those. You know, that's, that's not acceptable. The last one, the simplest way to understand this is the votes matter. The election results depend on how the votes and how the votes turn out. But more importantly, it says that the role of the Board of Canvassers, Board of Canvassers is this group of four people, um, both at the state level and at the county level, who decide that yes, you know, we're gonna bless the results as they're reported. Um, that the Board of Canvassers is really an administrative job. Your job is to say, yes, that's right, and pass it. If you remember from 2020, particularly for the, for the presidential election, that there was a dispute both in Wayne County as well as in, at the state level about whether the canvassers were going to permit, I guess, the count, the, the count of the votes that had been taken at other levels, at lower levels, permit those to be accepted as true. Not that they had any evidence that it wasn't, just they thought they had the authority to say, no, oh, I'm just not gonna accept it. And in 2020, it took the, dare I say it, heroic, the heroic judgment of one canvasser at the state level to say, we don't have the authority to say no. This is it, this is good. Had that person not been there, had somebody else been there, had he not been heroic, the election wouldn't have counted. Well, that's nuts. I mean, come on, that's nuts. The votes are in, the votes have been counted, the results are there. So under this proposal, the role of the Board of Canvassers and the authority, the limitation to the authority of the Board of Canvassers as to accepting the results of the, of the election are spelled out. So those are the eight points of, uh, that are in this proposal. It's a pretty major ch change. Um, but if you think about it, it really isn't much of a change at all. It says, it says voter identification, the way we're doing it now works. Let's keep doing it. It says people donating money to our donating services and money to us helps us out. Let's keep doing it. It says the board of canvassers approving the results of the election works the way it should. Let's keep doing that. Most of this proposal is about preventing bad actors from in the future, or even now, from in the future, saying, no, we want to change this. We want to change the rules because we want to change the outcome. That's what this proposal is really all about. So this is a, this is a constitutional amendment, 425,059 valid signatures that are needed to get it on the ballot and then to get it passed, obviously, uh, with 50% plus one of the vote. There are a number of petitions, as Sherry mentioned, there are a number of petitions that are out there trying to get on the ballot. Uh, this is one of them. Unfortunately, there's a number of petitions out there having to do with voting. Some of them are good, some of them are not. And it's gonna be a burden on all of us to not only make sure that we've got it straight in our heads, but that our friends and our family and everybody else that we know who's out there signing petitions or voting
can get it straight in their heads about which ones are good and which ones are not. Promote the Vote, Promote the Vote 2022 is one of the good ones. How do we know? Because Promote the Vote did what it did in 2018 and because it did what it did, we had record turnouts in 2020 in the year of the election of a pandemic, in a pandemic. And we had record turnout and that could not have happened, would not have happened had they not made that change, those changes in 2018. Right, the question Sally, I think. Okay, the question Sally's asking on Zoom, hi Sally, uh, <laughs> is about early voting. If we're gonna require nine days of voting, of early voting in advance of election day, that is a school or probably any other facility would have trouble making the space available, making the facilities available. That's probably correct. The proposal does not go into detail and say how this is supposed to be done. And it leaves it up to the local jurisdictions to figure it out, right? <laughs> to figure it out because of course that makes the most sense for uh, different communities will have different, uh, different facilities available. One of the things that they're particularly thinking about for, um, and again, it's not part of the proposal, but people are talking about this already, is <clears throat> how do we do this particularly for small communities, right? And one of the ways you do this is to combine, is to work together and create one facility that services a number of communities around, a number of communities, a number of different precincts. Again, the details of, of how to do that uh, need to be worked out and would be worked out at the local, at the local level, uh, at the individual or the group level. I would point out that we already do this in a, in a fashion today with the absentee voting, that uh, in many cases, the absentee voting, you have to have an absentee voting counting board and they have to have a facility to do this in. And in many cases, I know in 2020, uh, on a countywide basis, the county made facilities available so, so smaller communities could just say, you know, we're not going to do this. We're going to have uh, record turnouts in absentee voting. We can't handle it. And they, they combined all that effort into a very large facility that was able to blow through all that, uh, all that absentee voting very easily. And they did it by combining jurisdictions, by co combining communities. So that would be, that would be one of the ways uh, that, that we could address it. But again, it is not, it is not addressed in detail in the proposal. There's no, there's, there's no prescription there that says you have to do it this way. Timeline, I've talked about the timeline. Here it is. On July 11th, 425,059 valid signatures must be turned in to the Secretary of State's office in Lansing. Those of you who worked on VNP or worked on Promote the Vote in 2018, remember how exciting it was for the big truck to come pulling into Lansing and everybody formed the chain and <clears throat> passing all these boxes out. Uh, well, we're back at that. We're looking forward to that day uh, and it's gotta be on or before July 11th. Uh, in order to meet that deadline, VNP, voters not politicians, has set a deadline of June 30th, right? A little, a little over a week and a half early, earlier than that, <clears throat> as the date by which all the signatures have to be gathered up because, because VNP is going through its own validation of the signatures on the petitions before they turn them in. So if, if, if there are any difficulties they can be corrected before they get submitted to the Secretary of State's office. So June 30th is actually the cutoff date for folks like me and other folks in the room who are circulators, but folks like us to get the, get the last signature and turn them all in. The other thing is that number 425,059 is the number stipulated by law. In order to get that number, we are targeting as a coalition, promote the vote totally, is targeting 600,000 signatures between now and the end of June. 
600,000. I think that's almost, is that almost double what they did in 2018? Yeah. It's a big, big, big lift. But democracy is on the line, so we do what we got to do. Yeah, there's a question over here. That is a big lift, 600,000 signatures. But if we can do that, I think that one advantage, well, advantage, obviously, you want overkill in case there's invalid signatures, mm -hmm. and there always are. But those 600,000 people that had to think through that signature are going to be yes voters in the fall. Well, that, that's true. That's right. True. So, I mean, it's like you're campaigning for it, too. So instead of campaigning for 430,000, you're campaigning for 600,000. So Right. Yeah. The, the, and and, and there's, there's many reasons, as you say, there's many reasons why <clears throat> a signature on a petition might not be valid. The most likely reason is because somebody signed twice. Right? There's VNP, but VNP, Voters Not Politicians, has a goal, a, a goal as a member of the coalition, of 200,000 signatures. That's the uh, out of the 425,000, of 200,000. That means that there's over 200,000 signatures that are in the collective goal of ACLU, League of Women Voters, on and on, all these other groups that are part of the coalition. It is very likely, I think, very likely, that people are going to sign twice. Again, because there's so many petitions out there, and you know, this is one of the good ones. It's really important what Sherry said about having this checklist that we're providing back there, so that you've got a thing that says, oh yeah, I signed this one already, I'm good. And I, I will tell you that as a voting, Voters Not Politicians coordinator, when you sign, a, sign one of our petitions, we'll give you a sticker, if we still have it. We'll give you a sticker, we'll give you a bookmark, we'll give you a reminder that says, I, this is what I signed, I did this one already. Liz. So we had a question from the Zoom. Um, if you sign a petition twice, the person forgot, are both signatures voided or just the, addition, the extra signature? I'll tell you what I have heard. I have heard, no, one of them gets thrown out and the other one's good. And I've heard, no, they're both thrown out. I don't know. Uh, there, there are people, you know, there are smart people who know, and they're the people that gave me both answers. <laughs> so, so, so un unfortunately, no. So, so one of the things that one of the things that will happen, voters, not politicians, being what they are. Once the petitions are signed, they're going to go through a validation process within VNP, or maybe within Promote the Vote, before the Secretary of State ever sees them. Presumably, or hopefully, in the process of going through that validation, these duplicates will be identified. One of them will be struck off the li off the, uh, the off the sheet. The other one will be preserved. So that's that's my hope. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific answer for that, best, but yeah, best answer you could have at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. There's only one more slide. I, I promise. But it's the most important slide. What should you, you know, when you read this, say I, what should I do next? And what you should do is go to promotethevote2022.com, look for the button up in the corner that says take action, click on that button, put your name in, tell them you want to help, tell them you want to be a volunteer, tell them you want to be a circulator, tell them you want to help them you know, validate signatures, tell them you want to do you know, whatever, any way you can. And then after you've done that, and you send that in and you volunteered, go back to this page and you see the little button that says donate, click on that one. <laughs> click on that one. Because quite honestly, it's not only a big lift, but it's a very expensive lift. We're talking millions and millions of dollars that will be needed to make this happen. Uh, and that's, that's just you know, elections today, that's what it takes. But we are looking for uh, circulators. I know we have, how many people here are already signed up as circulators? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, C, oh, sorry, eight. Uh, so 
yeah, we, I mean, we, we need a lot of circulators. I'm field coordinator for four communities, Highland Township, Milford Township, Commerce Township, and White Lake Township, right? So that's just those four. There are communities south of us, South Lyon, Northville, Wald Lake, Novi. There is no field coordinator yet. Oh, yikes, right? And there's a lot of people down there and a lot of signatures to be gathered. So we're, we're, help, we're trying to help them out in the meantime, but we just, we need bodies, right? quite honestly. Uh, and if in addition to being a circulator, uh, you wanna step up and be a team leader, that would be great, because then you can help me coordinate people and get them, you know, figure out where people need to be and how to get people there and keeping track of all the, of all the petitions and all the numbers. Uh, Karen Adams is a hero to me because while I was off basking in Europe, she, she was dealing with all of this stuff. I know, and now, now it's her, her turn. But she was, she was taking care of all this launch uh, effort uh, in March, thank goodness. Um, and, and it's been tough. It has been very, very tough. The weather is not, it's not, uh, it's not helping, as you said, or you said, Liz said, last weekend was, was cold and miserable. Anyway, so that's where we are. The proposal is called Promote the Vote 2022. Uh, it's a constitutional amendment. It is the best one on the ballot. Well, it's the best one in the field, and it will be the best one on the ballot. And I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support. Thank you for your efforts to make it happen. Yes. Yeah. Questions? Liz? When we did this last time around, a couple of years ago, I know you sent us an email with some suggestions, places we could go. Will there be like a central, there was a wonderful sign up genius. So you could just go on every week and say, where's some place I can go with my clipboard and get signatures? Will they be coordinating something like that? I mean, that was super effective. That's my job. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, oh, no, you no, sent no, out a great email with some don't suggestions. Be because, but. Don't be because like I knew at this um, and I, I was not part of the VNP team back you know, first in, the, in round one. So yes, the answer is yes, there will be. Um, as soon as I can get my self together and make it happen. Great. And uh, my personal question is, do you have any insight? I know one of the other proposals that's out there has a provision to close that horrid loophole that allows the legislature to basically abscond with a ballot initiative mm -hmm. and gut it like they did with the fair wage. <clears throat> Why was that not included in this proposal? Because to me, that's the biggest difference between the other group's proposals right. and this one. Right, there is, there is another petition out there to close that loophole. As a matter of fact, that petition is pretty much standalone. It is like, that's the only thing it does, is close that loophole. Um, it was not included here, quite frankly, because it was going to make this larger than, uh, than it would otherwise have been. It's an article of the Constitution that was different from everything else. And so it would have just made this, you know, this is a very long petition read here. Uh, it would have made it much, much larger. And they said, you know, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna stay focused uh, on this piece. Well, I'm gonna be here. Um, petitions are, are in the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, petitions are in the back of the room. Thank you for your time. And uh, let's go make this happen. I'm sorry, you just got a hand up? What's on the, in other words, on the petition itself, if you hand it to somebody, yeah. how much do they have to read? Okay, when, when <clears throat> if you haven't done this before, or even if you have, uh, on the front of the petition is a, is a 100 word summary of everything that I said, right? It's right up here. But on the back of it is the actual, the actual text of the Constitution okay. with its changes. Um, so if somebody wants to say, well, I don't believe what you just told me it was gonna do, I wanna see the actual thing, here it is. Uh, I will say we had no one on our weekend of petition signature gathering 
that truly wanted to read anything. Yeah. I had one person today who said, I want to go and read the whole thing. I'm going to go online and read it. Yeah. So it, it, it helps if you're prepared, you've read it, so you can answer questions. Right, and, and we will provide cheat sheets and other things to, to help you out, and training, and training for that. Right, anything else? Yes. I'll be here. Oh, go ahead. Is there an opposing petition to this? Is there an opposing petition? Yes. The answer is yes. And you know, luckily my phone is ringing, so now I can't answer your question. Uh, sorry. No, uh, the, uh, there, there, is, there is an opposing petition. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of them. I, I think I mentioned one, my audit, uh, which has to do with auditing elections. And the other one, uh, whose name I will not mention, now, there are no other petitions, well, there are no, no other opposing petitions which are trying to be constitutional amendments. They're trying to be state statutes um, and for, for tactical reasons. That's where, that's where they're going. Um, one of the questions that nobody asked, one of the questions that uh, often comes up is, what if they all get on the ballot? What if they all pass? then what, right? And the, the, the rule is, number one, constitutional amendments take precedence over everything. So the constitutional amendment passes, it's in charge. The problem, is, or the question is, what if more than one constitutional amendment passes um, that both have to do with voting rights? And the answer is, the answer is, they both take effect as long as they don't conflict with each other. And if they do conflict with each other, then the one that has the most votes wins. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. That was very informative and very clear.